So do you think um, that there are anything that we need to do differently? We just had um, a set of the election. We still have um, more elections. Some states will be voting tomorrow, and we still have the March 11 election. With the cash crunch and all the policy, policy uh, dynamics with the Central Bank of Nigeria, are there lessons to be learned or things to be done differently? Things must be done differently. Uh, I mean, INEC officials need to come there on time. That's another major challenge that we have. Uh, we, we will be, we'll begin to assess the BIVA. And all of a sudden, uh, we, in previous elections, we've not heard uh, people stealing beaver machine. Mm. machines. But this time we hear that people are snatching beaver machines. So that's another thing the security agent need to look at because now they are seeing beaver as an obstruction to what they normally do. So instead of snatching the ballot, but you start snap the beaver machine and it's as good as voting hasn't taken place there. So we need to improve on security. And for me, that's what I think. Uh, I think we still have Abraham uh, online. Abraham, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Ah, yeah. I'm sorry, we forgot that you were still on, so now that you're back. Um, looking at all of the conversations that we've had, I have some state, um, data and statistics here with me. Um, federal elections turn up projections across the country. I'll just quickly take a, a look at some of them, if we can get that on our screen right now. Um, we have for Sokoto, 71% um, of turnouts and early arrival. Um, there was... Um, we. we Niger State had 100% early arrival, uh, and um, we also had 100% um, in Kanu, 33% in Bauchi, Gombe had 50%. Let's come down south. Down south, Cross River State is the only state um, on the map that was able to record 100%. River State had 67%. Bayelsa had 0%. Um, Delta State had 50% early arrival of materials and turnout. So the statistics seems to be incredible in some parts and in some other parts it's dwindling. Um, and for an election um, such as this that people have uh, somewhat either come, uh, have decided to come out and vote for different reasons, either because they're tired, they want good governance, or because you know they've come, come of age or come to an understanding that their vote is their right to be able to ask for accountability. One would have thought that people will come out en masse especially with the new entrance of young people who are a high percentage of the voters for this election? Uh, first, allow me to touch on two things before I deal with that question, uh, part of your discussion, uh, discussion in the room. Uh, the, I, I see from the previous uh, participant that there are some anomalies you know, in the election in terms of violation of the Electoral Act. And it's, it's important to know, particularly for people who are running for, uh, you know, House of Reps, um, Sanitaria, uh, and, and so even the presidency, that there are provisions within the act for respite or for re remedy in court. So if people and people that are still your viewers who are still watching at this uh, moment, who are at different polling units, have sufficient video evidence to say that uh, section 123, section 124, I think section 123 deals with offense relating to election, uh, any form of offense, and section 24 deals with bribery, and section 125 deals with undue influence, section 126 deals with election offenses. Each of these things carry even uh, up imprisonment. So people should be careful and people should also get as much evidence as sometimes the election is not over until it's over. Sometimes there are respite and uh, remedies in court. So as many people that are out there and they can capture evidence of anomalies, malpractices, and violation of the Electoral Act, this is the reason why we fought hard to have an Electoral Act. Secondly, you spoke about the revolution. And in my view, it is very important that we have a change of mindset and regulate, particularly through the media, the languages that we use. Mm -hmm. I think what might be going on in Nigeria, what is going on in Nigeria, it is an agitation rather than a revolution. Now, I'm saying this because one of the problems we had in terms of you know, stakeholders' engagement uh, when we got involved with the panels or get involved with members of the panel, different panels that were set up after NSAS. And even during NSAS, you know, interacting with stakeholders in the country, it comes across as the current executive or administrators were at some point thinking that this was an insurrection or an attempt to overthrow. 
Now, we are a democracy and there are processes and our youth are enlightened. Uh, it is not necessarily that our youth want to overthrow our government. We're not going back into anarchy, but our youth are agitated because people are suffering. There are all kinds of things that are going on in the country and people are expressing. So I see what is going on in Nigeria more as an agitation than a revolution. Because in a revolution, it's like we want to torpedo uh, the current system, we want to remove them by force. No, we are saying, or people are saying, or the youth are saying, that they need to cater for citizens. You know, they need to obey at least Maslow's hierarchy of need and take care of the physiological need of the human being in Nigeria. Now, going back um, to your last question, in terms of uh, voters' apathy, I doubt uh, very significantly that there will be anywhere, anywhere in the world, let alone in Nigeria, where there will be 100% turnout. And this, in some cases, might be uh, ways that political parties or members or, or you know, people that are on the ballot box, particularly House of Reps and stuff like that, may already write attendance record that is not even there. There is nowhere in the world where there will be 100% turnout. Because some people might die before the time, some people might be in the hospital, mm. some people might just not be able to. And the election is not over yet for us to be able to categorically say that there is 100% turnout. But relatively, this election has come across to me as a successful one, like my colleague in the studio said. Thank mm. you. Let me let me look at um, some, some, some researchers um, did a little... I mean, what I read out at first was projection, but then... Um, a few people who were in the field today were asked um, about, you know, um, the turnouts. First question was, did materials arrive on time? Um, well, 41%, 41 uh, 41.3% people said yes. 58.7% um, said no. Um, is the turnout high um, or moderate? Well, 32.5% said it was moderate. 41.3% um, said it was high and 7.1% said it was low. Also, the other question was that, are there any insecurity issues? 96.1% um, voted yes, while 3.9%, uh, sorry, 96.1% 90, voted no, while 3.9% voted yes. So we have 3.9% of relative peace at polling units, and 91.0% we have more insecurity. Um, uh, and what does this say about this election? As much as we're saying that it's successful, to borrow your words, um, can we really have a successful election, Abraham, if we have 91.6% or more saying that the elections um, was clouded or rather marred by, um, you know, insecurity? I think we have to wait for, uh, I mean, the empirical evidence matters a lot in making conclusions and assertions about the election, and I retract what I said, but relatively, I mean, we, there is so much fear and trepidation ahead of this election that we thought this election might not even hold, we thought all kinds of things. But from what we have seen, there is pocket of you know chaos here and there, but it comes across that there has been an ambience, I mean, 96% uh, saying no, there has been no insecurity is a huge success, however, that is, I don't know what the, uh, the scope of the data that you have, because I'm very interested in data. So if you have only pulled one or two polling units, that would not be sufficient out of 8,000, uh, uh, you know, uh, 200 and something polling units in the country. So we might want to have a broader, uh, that, that's an excellent job that your uh, station, uh, you know, has done, by the way. Oh, but uh, I, Abraham, I think it wasn't, we would it need that data so more across I'm board. sorry, Abraham, it's not PLOS TV Africa that um, did that um, research. It's, called, uh, it's a, a group of researchers called SBM Intelligence. So they gather intelligence from across the country, and their researchers are uh, spread across the 36 states, including the FCT. So it would then matter to me again to see who they are, what their background is, if uh, they the data that they gather, how they, what kind of methodology do they use in gathering their data, and how viable are those data. Because in Nigeria, we are extremely frivolous about statistics. We're extremely bogus about claims. So we say things like Nigeria is the headquarter of poverty in the world, where Nigeria is not even the first uh, 50 poor country in the world. 
But we threw data out just to be able to, you know, create all kinds of opinions in the country. And it matters to me that our data is accurate. But if that data is accurate, relatively 96.1% saying no, there is no insecurity, is a huge success. I don't think even America, that we copy democracy is uh, from, can say that they had 80%, uh, you know, good in terms of insecurity. There are always elections all over the world. Like I always believe, there is a causation between elections and terrorism. I believe that one of the biggest problems of this world is election election process. Election brings pandemic and election brings war. <laughs> oh, back to you. I want to hold on to the last <laughs> part of it, but uh, unfortunately, it, it might be, um, you know, the realities of, you know, today. Um, before we let you go, gentlemen, um, we hear that um, elections are still holding in seven, several places. It still might continue tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, so it might take a while for us to get to the results here. Um, but looking at the elections that we're going to have uh, for the governorship and state houses of assembly, what should INEC quickly learn from this process from today? You see, the problem is that we keep saying, what would INEC learn? This is not new. Everything that is happening is not new to INEC. Mm. Everything. It always happens. So there, there must be something they are not doing well. Mm. They need to begin to improve on their logistic. They need to begin to improve on their security. They need to begin to improve on their movement of their sensitive materials. These problems are not new problems. So if something that is just jacking up new problems, then mm. you begin to uh, come in, uh, officials come in late, and then people are not able to vote. Then they are staying late to the night. They don't make provision for, 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 for power for them to vote. All these things are in existence. Remember, this is not the first election INEC, most of the challenges that we are covering, INEC told us that during state elections, those state elections, they've done a round out of it, they even did a mock election and everything. So definitely the challenges are still the same challenges that we've been having since INEC is conducting elections. So that brings me back to what I keep saying. There must be a system, there must be a procedural way, a way how you, you go about your elections. You need to come up with a procedure. Is it A, B, C, D? This is what you need to look at. This is our variable. This is our take home. This is our objective. This is what must be there. This. So all these things are not rocket science. Then mean INEC has a lot to do because whatever is happening now is not new. Hmm. All right. Um, um, maybe we should have um, one last word from Abraham the Great. Uh, because uh, Mukhtar feels that um, INEC has been uh, with this process for years. Uh, they've conducted elections for a long time. And these uh, issues have been coming up um, over the years, and uh, it's not really new issues of logistics, issues of uh, moving sensitive materials. We had a guest earlier on, uh, he, uh, he went historically and said Fedeco back in the day used to have their own vehicles, so these issues of a late arrival of materials would have been forestalled if INEC had their own uh, uh, vehicles and all of that. Do you agree? Well, I agree totally with my colleague in the studio. I think I, I more or less agreed with everything uh, that he has said today. A uh, very great man in the studio. Um, but, but saying that, you know, in project management, we always say that there is no absolute, you know, there's no absolute project. You can, we use different, uh, you know, system to be able to measure sex success. And I would not know what system um, INEC will use. Like, for example, you can use system like Six Sigma to be able to measure, uh, you know, what the success rate and what can be done afterwards to make the next election better. But there is something I would commend INEC for. I think since the time of President Goodluck Jonathan, Nigeria has led even the world. Uh, even America were not even as techy as what, what, what we went in 2015. And now with the introduction of beavers, in the UK we don't even have that. Uh, and, uh, and now with the tr electronic transmission. And the next thing I want to hear in the next four, eight years, 12 years is that Nigerians don't even need to come up. They can post it or they can, you know, you, just the same way you, you know, you know, you vote uh, on the phone for BB Niger or what have you. All of these things can be tried. We are moving ahead of the world in, in terms of that. So we will need this uh, election to complete, I mean, to conclude before we can begin to make proper recommendations to INEC. But so far, from what I am seeing, I say kudos. Uh, to INEC, particularly, you know, uh, um, the way that they have conducted 
themselves so far, but we don't know more uh, issues that we may hear. All right, thank you, Abraham. Thank you so much for speaking, us, uh, speaking with us, Mukhtar. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. We, we love these moments where we have to talk about Nigeria and the elections. And uh, we're looking forward to see what happens in the coming days and um, hopefully uh, the collation of results. Thank you so much, gentlemen. My pleasure. It's still the ballot 2023. We'll take a break. We'll be back with more developments as we get ready uh, to hear from the INEC chairman in a few hours. Hello, hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.